Continuing with the system of development life cycle, um, just uh, I suppose to add to the uh, well, the discussion of methods, anyways, not really a, a specific method, but just to uh, remind uh, you of the um, maturity models in the security frameworks that we talked about earlier. And uh, again, adding um, the uh, considerations in the maturity models to the system development life cycle is um, a good idea and uh, something that we should uh, consider. Uh, now, in terms of development, um, for those who are actually programmers, uh, this is going to seem a little simplistic, um, but unfortunately, as I said earlier, um, this is this is an area of concern, and in terms of application development security, um, we do not have uh, a lot of people. Uh, in the security field who have uh, programming experience, who, who have participated in application development. And, and so I'm going to have to cover some of the basics here. Um, in addition, um, an awful lot of the people who have uh, uh, who worked in development, who, who know programming, uh, don't care anything about security, or at least, you know, security has not been presented to them, perhaps, in, in the right way. Um, the, uh, again, Spaff's dictum that a secure computer system is one that does what it's supposed to, uh, should give us common cause with the developers, that uh, developers um, should understand that if you if you program the application properly, if you do development in the right way, um, you will be creating a secure system, a system that does what it's supposed to and doesn't do what it's not supposed to. Unfortunately, uh, we have chosen to go the uh, rapid application development route. Um, time to market is everything, and uh, all other considerations are secondary. And, and so um, we reward people for taking shortcuts, for not doing the development thoroughly, for not um, uh, properly defining the idea, for not uh, defining the requirements, including the security requirements, um, and uh, you know if it's if it's not going to immediately affect the uh, performance of the application, um, it's not important, and unfortunately that leads to all kinds of problems. But um, anyways, as I say, uh, this is. This is basic material, um, and so those of you who uh, have done programming, you know, you can skip to the next one. Um, we are dealing with uh, development tools here um, uh, when we are programming. Um, uh, well, I, I mean, there is, of course, uh, straight-up machine language programming. Uh, as one of the uh, jokes in, in programming has it, real programmers use copycomprogram.exe. Uh, in other words, you just you know you you type in the machine language. You you know the system well enough uh, to uh, create a program uh, in that way without any tools. Um, that is unrealistic and, and 
these days everybody is using, uh, generally speaking, a high-level uh, programming language. But anyways, uh, there is machine language, which is the actual op codes, operation codes of the uh, CPU. Uh, and then there are assemblers, which are close to that. Uh, they are uh, dealing with the... Uh, uh, more or less uh, direct translation between, you know, one-to-one -one from the uh, assembler commands to uh, the opcodes themselves. But um, we've got uh, uh, higher level languages that are uh, used more frequently uh, in our normal work and we will uh, continue with that. So we've got uh, assemblers, uh, again, dealing with the assembly language. We've got compilers at, at the high-level language that compile the uh, program that we have written in a high-level language into the machine code. Um, there are other utilities involved in the compilation process. Uh, sometimes there are uh, linkers, there are other utilities, but uh, uh, basically this is taking the high-level language and turning it into an executable uh, machine language file. Now, that's one. Then there are interpreted languages. And here we take the uh, high-level programming language and it is being, um, uh, well, it is being compiled into uh, machine language, but it is essentially doing that on the fly. The, the interpreter is uh, picking up the uh, statements, the high-level language statements, and is outputting a, a chunk of code which the computer then executes. Um, so it doesn't produce a separate machine language file uh, uh, as, as an entire piece. Um, it uh, instead is, is doing it, you know, piece by piece as it, as it goes. And so there are uh, uh, some trade-offs in, in speed there for the convenience of not having to uh, uh, compile it. Um, into a single executable file with uh, the machine language commands all, all ready to go. Uh, there are advantages to both. Um, there is going to be a speed language uh, advantage in terms of the compiler. You compile it once and then you can run it as many times as you like and it runs faster than an interpreted uh, program. Um, the uh, uh, advantage, though, is that when we're, we're dealing with um, interpreted uh, languages, um, as long as there's an interpreter for the platform that uh, we are using, um, we can, in fact, uh, use the same uh, high-level language program uh, on a number of different platforms without recompiling for each specific platform that we are going to be using. Uh, so there's uh, issues there uh, and considerations. Anyways, we will be uh, going on to a few other topics here.